Yeah. So uh, before I dive into the talk, uh, I also want to mention that, uh, you know, you can uh, ask questions during the talk. I'm happy to take them. Uh, also, uh, I, I think there should be a lot, lot, lot of time in the end where you can uh, ask me more questions. Cool. Um, so before uh, going into embeddings, uh, I want to give kind of uh, how, how things looked uh, before we started doing embeddings at OpenAI. Uh, so OpenAI, I think like a lot of our big releases were using generative models. Uh, generative models are basically uh, trained to maximize the likelihood of, of data uh, and they can generate realistic content. Um, and apart from like, you know, just generating realistic co content, usually when a model is trained to maximize the likelihood, it starts having uh, useful representations that are then useful for many downstream tasks. So for example, um, one of our uh, first releases with, uh, with the generative modeling paradigm was, uh, was the GPT uh, class of models. So here, like, you know, the first uh, two to three lines is like the prompt given to the model. And then the model writes the rest of the poem. Uh, and, you know, apart from writing poems, it's like really good at many, many things like uh, summarizing, uh, machine translation, and, and, and so on. Like anywhere you can think, anywhere you want like uh, text to be generated. Um, it turned out that having a very good generative model that's trained on lots of unsupervised data uh, also was just like good at solving many tasks in, in, uh, in what people refer to as few shot mode. So here, you know, the, 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 we give the model few examples uh, of like desired behavior. Uh, so, you know, it starts with like a poor English input followed by how, to how it's fixed. And you give it a few examples, like how it's shown here. And then in the end, you give it a new poor English input, like I'd be more than happy to work with you in another project. Uh, and it, the model now generates the, the corrected version. And, and this, is, uh, this was a big deal. Um, you know, typically machine learning models work by having lots of task specific data um, and here you had this model that was trained uh, to maximize the likelihood of internet data, basically. And it had this, like, uh, this new behavior emerged from that training. Uh, and this was like um, one of the reasons why uh, I think GPT-3 uh, uh, got a lot of attention. Um, so similar to kind of text generation, we also started doing work on code generation. Um, so here you give it, you know, your helper function and, and then a prompt, like, you know, the, it's like the uh, comment in the first line uh, and then the model fills out the code for you. Um, so we have uh, things like uh, Copilot, which is done in collaboration with GitHub. Um, that you can check it out. Uh, you, you can play with these models uh, if you if you install that. And yeah, these models are pretty good at generating code uh, given uh, given the text description of, of the task uh, you want. Cool. And this kind of like same um, principle of of generative models um, went from text to code and then um, now, uh, recently, we uh, we put out Dolly 2, uh, where you give it a text uh, description, uh, as shown in the right, and then the model uh, uh, generates the image for you. Um, this is this is a pretty cool application uh, of, of, again, this high-level idea of like training generative models that maximize the likelihood uh, of your data. And kind of like the same principle works across modalities and you don't really need a lot of task specific data. Uh, you can train these models on, you know, uh, internet data and, and these are starting to work uh, really well. And 
to give you a little bit more details on you know how these generative models work um so here is like an example for for text generation uh let's say it's a, like a character level model uh so let's say you have the word hello um so you get the the model reads uh when it's at the character level language model it reads one character at a time so that's the input uh right it's like h followed by e and so on and then at every time step the model has to predict the next character that comes in the sequence so at time step one it has to predict e and then l and then so on okay and how does it go about doing it um it it first like uh has like a unique uh place for every character and then there's a lookup table that generates what is called as embeddings um and what are these these are just vector representations uh that the model uh, slowly gets better at doing uh, over training. And these vector representations are basically optimized to predict the next uh, next item in the sequence. OK. Um, and then it turns out you know, these models are deep, which means that there are multiple layers of vector representations before the model uh, predicts the output. So this is a uh, standard. Uh, deep learning setup. Uh, the thing with generative models is, you know, the all the intermediate vector representations or embeddings, uh, th there is not really a single vector um, or, or, or the models are not explicitly optimized to produce a single vector or embedding that captures whole of the input. Uh, here, like the, because the training objective is, is to predict the next character, um there's not like a place after training there's not like a vector you can go back uh in the model and say this has the most information about the input and that th that property uh of like having a single vector representation for an input could actually be useful for many tasks um so think about um uh, an application like search um, you want to search on like million documents, billion documents or whatever, right? Um, in those cases, uh, the documents, you need to like process them. Usually, typically like with Google, for example, you would process them offline, uh, compute some kind of representation and build an index. Um, this is how like search systems work. And there's no natural way to do this with with like an output of a generative model, uh, you, you can't really use it uh, to to build kind of vector indices indices of of uh, of large collections. And then data visualization. Um, so for for things like clustering uh, or or any kinds of like visual analysis of of uh, of data, again, it would be so useful to have a single vector. That represents whole of the input, um, and then finally, uh, this is uh, what people refer to as linear probe classification. Here, the idea is quite simple: um, you have a powerful model that gives you a vector representation of the input uh, or embedding of the input, and then you could train like a simple linear model uh, using those uh, embeddings as features. Uh, this is a very common setup, uh, both in research and uh, and in the, uh, and in the industry um, and so there's basically a ton of applications where uh, having a single embedding of the input uh, is, is is quite important and and kind of like the goal uh, of our work is can we can we get models uh, unsurprised models that are good at gen are good at getting these kind of single embedding for, for, for a given input. Okay, so if you if you take up, uh, so, so like generative models, there's a class of models called contrastive models. And what they do uh, is they take up pair data as input. Uh, the model produces a single embedding for each side. And then the score 
of similarity is given by you know cosine similarity between these two vectors. Um, and I'll get into more details um, about this about this particular setup. Um, but for now, the most important takeaway is that these contrastive models are explicitly optimized to learn a single embedding of the input. And, and the goal of this work is, can we learn high quality text and code embeddings uh, just in unsupervised data uh, with contrastive models? Um, cool. So this is the high level out outline of, of, of things I'm gonna to discuss today. Um, so I'll, I'll go slightly more in detail about the contrast models. Um, any questions so far? Okay, cool. I will keep going. Cool. So an embedding model, um, you know, the basic kind of block is you're given an input X, um, you kind of add start of sequence and end of sequence tokens in the uh, in the start and the beginning, uh, and then you encode that with a neural network model, and then you get back a single vector representation of the whole input. Uh, one way uh, to do this, and this is how we do it in our work, is you could take uh, an architecture called transformer. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with it. The transformer model is basically like any other kind of uh, deep learning model uh, that converts, th that has multiple layers and it takes the input and gradually builds vector representations at multiple levels of abstraction. And we, uh, in, in our work, we basically say uh, the embedding of the input uh, is the last vector embedding uh, last in terms of the time step and from the last layer. So, uh, and and this is the embedding we're going to use for computing similarity scores. And, you know, the, the, the second one, the second building block um, is computing similarity between two sequences. So this is how the model is trained. Uh, this is like, becomes like a basic uh, building block. And here, let's say you're given two input, uh, two inputs X and Y, you encode them, you get their embeddings, and then the similarity is given by uh, the, uh, the cosine similarity between these two uh, vectors. So yeah, so this is quite simple uh, on how we go about it. And to train these models, uh, you would need pair data. So the, the X and Y, you saw before, you need uh, you know some way to to get similar pairs, um, and you know s similarity is this like uh, you know if you think about similarity for data, text or code, it, it's hard to pin down that this is uh, the only notion of similarity. Like for example, a co a common uh, thing that's hard to label is is a, is a thing and it's negation similar. Um, and it kind of like depends on the application. So you'll see this kind of come back where it is not completely well-defined and that leads to some issues. Uh, but apart from that, the idea is the pair data, the par pair data you supply during training are basically how you define similarity to be. And then the model basically um, learns to put two things that are uh, that you provide are similar close to each other in the vector space. Um, kind of more details here is the, the 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 input is a list of paired examples, and then when you do gradient descent, uh, you take a batch of batch of your training data, and then a single you have a single x comma y pair that acts as the positive example. Um, and there is no like explicit negative example that is provided. Um, all, this, all this is done because then it's like easier to consume unsupervised data. So um, the negative examples are 
so if you have x comma y and then you have a bunch of other examples then uh, all the other examples in the batch act as negatives for a given example um, so if you have like a batch size of n uh, there are n minus one negatives for each example and this is uh, this is just like an assumption that those that these are negative examples uh, this is motivated by the fact that if you construct negatives this way uh, you can reuse a lot of the computation um, and, and, and training becomes uh, very efficient cool um, so this the next thing I want to discuss here is um, what, what, what what's the source of bad data uh, and again here our goal is can we train these models with unsupervised data uh, and for text we just say neighboring pieces of text so this could be like neighboring paragraphs uh, a sentence in one paragraph and it's adjacent paragraph and things like that those are the positive examples and then for code uh, you know it's the uh, you know the top comment for a function um, followed by the code itself so the pair data uh, basically comes from there So before we dive into more details about the exact recipe, um, I want to share a quick early experiment that we did. Um, and so the batch size turns out to be really, really crucial with these models. So by you know uh, increasing it by an order of magnitude, the performance on, for example, here we show a search task, uh, the performance goes up quite a lot um, and intuitively this is happening uh, because as I said uh, if you have n examples in your batch uh, for every example there is there is n minus one negatives so by simply increasing the batch size uh, the chances that the model is going to see like a hard negative example that it has to contrast with um, that in that increases uh, and that makes the model perform much, much better. And, and this was like one of the crucial uh, insights coming out of this work. And a lot of our kind of research later on was like how to actually um, scale batch size efficiently um, uh, without you know, blowing up the number of uh, GPUs you would need to train these models. Cool. Um, so I'll come, I'll, I'll, I'll now describe just the high level recipe to train these models. Uh, it's actually, the high level re recipe is like pretty simple. You collect pair data. Uh, so the pair data basically gives you the notion of, uh, of similarity that you want from these models and then train with sufficiently large batch size. Um, one more detail we do is like the encoder is actually initialized with some pre-trained model. Um, we found that the contrastive loss on its own is not good enough uh, as a training signal to learn high quality embeddings. Um, so what would what this means is, you know, let's take text embeddings. Uh, we initialize the encoder with GPT, uh, which is the text generation model. We collect pair data of text pairs uh, just from internet. And then we train with a sufficiently large batch size. So for now code embedding models, we initialize with codex, which is the code generation model. And then we collect comment, comma, code pairs, uh, again, from open source code. And then we train with sufficiently large batch size. So kind of like the same, uh, recipe, um, works pretty well, uh, for generating these, uh, high quality embeddings. And you know, before we dive into the results, um, I want to make a point on like why our work is different from previous work. Um, almost all previous work um, 
basically it trains kind of separate embedding models for every task. You know, if you want to use it for classification features, you have an embedding, different embedding model. If you have a, if you want something for search, you have a completely different model, completely different as in like, you know, the architecture to training data to loss function, everything is kind of change, change everything changes. Um, and for us, we wanted to try to see if we can get all these kinds of uh, desired downstream behavior from a single unsupervised model. And th that was the big uh, motivation for the work. And next I'll discuss some experiments that we did um, that seems to indicate that uh, we have this like single powerful uh, unsupervised embedding model. Cool. Um, so this is like a simple experiment for data visualization. So we took Amazon reviews, uh, you know, you get uh, like a thousand order of thousand dimensional vectors from the embedding model. And then you do low dimensional project uh, projection. Here we reduce it to two dimensions. And basically, you know, the reviews line up uh, according to their sentiment, uh, even though the model actually never saw the, uh, you know, the sentiment label in the data set. Uh, it kind of inferred the property just from uh, just from the text. So yeah, the, the green colored ones are, you know, uh, we, we basically project the text into two dimensions and then we color them based on whether they got a positive review or a negative review. The negative one has you know, the shades of red color and the positive ones have shades of green color. And uh, yeah, as you can see, there's like a clear separation uh, b between the positive and the negative. The model has just picked up uh, without any uh, label data. Um, so as I said, um, these models are trained with very large batch size. Uh, so we train four different models uh, with, uh, uh, with a different number of parameters in the model. Uh, and then the embedding dimensions go from 1,000 all the way to 12,000. Okay, so this is like, you know, details on the setup. And the first experiment we did, uh, this is um, a classification ex experiment. Um, we tested it on like seven data sets. Um, all these are, you know, tasks like, for example, movie review classification, which is kind of similar to the sentiment classification we talked about. Uh, you know, there's data sets on topic classification and things like that. So the setup is you're given input text and you want to assign it to one of the many labels. Um, here, um, how we evaluate uh, uh, the models is you take the embeddings from the unsupervised model and then you train a simple linear classifier with these as features. So the idea here is if your model produces better features, then it should lead to better downstream performance using these features. So the first thing to note uh, is we start doing quite well, even with uh, the small model. Uh, and as we scale up uh, the performance, uh, just almost uniformly goes up across us and we kind of start doing much better uh, than previous work on, on having these unsupervised models for giving features. Um, next up, uh, the task is the same. Uh, I've added a set of uh, experimental results in the bottom half now. Um, here, the setting is we take the unsupervised model and then we further fine tune on what is called NLI data. Uh, NLI is a short form for natural language inference. Uh, so here um, the data is you're given pairs of sentences uh, and then uh, you know there's, there's human annotations on whether these two sentences are, you know, whether the relationship between them is entailing contradicting or neutral. Um, so the model is further 
uh, fine-tuned on this um, on on this uh, human annotated data. And yeah, again, in this setting, we do better than previous work. Um, and uh, we see an imp a small improvement uh, over just using the unsupervised model. Uh, but again, like I, I feel like probably the bigger takeaway here is the, the big unsupervised model is actually better than pre previous approaches that uh, use human annotated data, uh, uh, which was like kind of like the uh, main focus of this uh, research book. Cool. So the next set of experiments are on text search. Uh, and all these are zero shot evals. So the model did not see any training data for this particular uh, domain. Um, so you have a bunch of different text search data sets. And, you know, again, we started getting pretty good results uh, just with the unsurprised models. Um, and then we, just like before with classification, we took a small number, amount of examples from MS Marco, which is a public uh, search data set from Microsoft. Um, and then once we do that, we start doing much better than previous embedding methods. Uh, you know, uh, for, for, I mean, it, it, it was common in the literature to not even have the unsupervised model evaluated on these tasks uh, because they perform uh, really poorly. And I think like with our, with our approach, we were able to start making these models uh, do non-trivial things for both uh, classification we discussed before and now for search. And then with further fine tuning, we start getting uh, the best results. Um, you know, the, the last section of results from previous work are, are basically not embedding based methods. Uh, you know, they, they use more computation at, at query time. Um, and those methods are more competitive uh, with the results we show here. Cool. Um, okay, so our models perform quite well on search and classification. Um, and we found this very um, interesting behavior. Um, and this comes back to what I was telling you uh, all about uh, how it's hard to define a notion of similarity that is consistent across applications. Um, so there are academic data sets called sentence similarity. Um, and even though our unsupervised models does really well on search and classification, uh, it actually performs really poor uh, on these sentence similarity tasks. Um, we don't have a very concrete understanding of what, uh, why this is happening. Um, but our intuition is that, you know, similarity, it's, it's, it's like, could mean different things in different contexts. Uh, what, uh, I, I think there's like a famous quote uh, by a linguist on like, uh, you know, there's like infinite notions of similarity, uh, which one should we annotate for. Um, so I think it's coming out of that. I think, uh, you know, there, there, you know, as I said, there are tasks where you want, you know, a sentence and its negation to be close to each other. And I feel like with search and classification data sets, I think they were annotated in a way where, you know, a thing and its negation can be close to each other and it's still fine. And then I, I think with these, uh, with these tasks, the model had to explicitly kind of uh, put them far apart. And that, that the model did not learn that uh, concept uh, from unsupervised data. And I think that's why the models don't perform that well. Um, you know, kind of like a rough evidence for that is, um, this is like, as we train for more steps, so from 2000 steps to 50,000 steps, uh, the model's performance on search and classification goes up. Um, while the performance on these sentence similarity tasks actually go down. Uh, so yeah, I think if you look at internet text, maybe there, there is lots more of like, you know, debate and argument of like going back and forth. And, and they are like kind of like uh, 
part of the parrot data for training and the model picks that picks up that to me to be the same thing um and whereas uh these tasks want them to be separated um so th this is our current uh intuition on why this is happening but this was like a, a cool thing that came out of the this um whole work that um you know these models pretty good for search and classification but quite bad for another set of tasks okay so all the previous experiments were using uh, the text embedding model. Uh, now I'll proceed to code search. Um, code search task is uh, given a language query uh, <clears throat> and, and, and a bunch of code blocks, uh, pick the most relevant one. Um, and here, you know, basically we do really well uh, compared to previous approaches. Uh, as shown by the results, um, the model was just like really, really good at this task of uh, getting the best uh, code function or code block that uh, captures the thing that's uh, needed by the text query. And we also did like a much larger scale experiment. Um, you know, instead of picking the correct code among a thousand candidates, can it do a harder task of picking the code among 10,000 candidates, right? And, you know, uh, the performance drops a bit compared to the previous one, um, but it's still pretty good at this task. Um, what I found interesting was uh, even the text embedding model was, especially if you look at Python, uh, results in Python, uh, the model is actually quite good at it. Uh, I, yeah, it's just like, probably there's just like lots of, code information uh, in internet text. And the model has kind of picked up on Python uh, just because of large scale unsupervised learning. And, and, and this was like quite cool that the text embedding model was, um, was already quite decent uh, for code. Cool. Um, so yeah, so we discussed, uh, you know, these embedding models, uh, high level, view of how to train them and lots of experimental results. We also have these models in the OpenAI API now. You can call call the API and get back vector representations for text and code. And uh, this is kind of like uh, being used uh, quite a lot, um, you know, with, with previous, uh, so here's an example from one of our uh, customers who uses the embedding endpoints and with the, yeah, with the previous embeddings, there was a little bit more of things getting, uh, you know, uh, not things that you want in the same cluster. So this is like, um, all these codes are, you know, uh, you take the embedding from the model uh, for, for a lot of text pieces, and then you do clustering. And so this is what is present inside a single cluster. Um, and you can see with the previous embeddings, uh, the model has like, you know, issues with the with the app and the good things about the app put in the same cluster. And then with our embeddings, um, uh, our customer was able to get, um, you know, basically uh, a better, better clustering uh, outputs. So this is all about kind of uh, things not working up working. Um, and the second experiment is on like zero shot classification. So given a text data point, uh, assign a label to that uh, text piece. Um, so the highest perform, so here uh, it's basically the Y axis is accuracy. Um, the X axis is like number of attempts. Basically you take the top K, predi K predictions and even if one of them is right, you give the model points to it. Um, so the best performing one uh, are subject matter experts. These are, you know, trained human annotators. And then the next four lines are basically uh, the four different models that I talked about uh, from the API. And then the ones below that are embeddings from previous work. So uh, our model is able to do this task again, pretty, pretty well. And I think it's like quite cool that uh, 
you know, an unsupervised model uh, that's just like trained on lots of inter internet text, um, does really well on many academic data sets. And now the same model is doing well on downstream applications too uh, for, for uh, in, in the real world. And I think this is like kind of like a paradigm shift uh, for machine learning of like moving from task specific uh, supervised data to now having relying almost entirely just on unsupervised learning. Cool. So we talked about, uh, you know, contrastive models, how they're different from generative models, uh, how to train them, uh, importance of batch size, uh, uh, you know, the high level summary uh, of how to train these models, comparison with previous work. And then I talked about experiments on uh, text classification, text search and code search. Uh, and then we also uh, talked about how these models are available in the API. So to conclude, uh, you know, we have this extremely simple recipe to train these embedding models. Uh, they are unsupervised models that have a very broad range of capabilities. Um, you know, uh, and these are just trained on internet data and the same model performs really well on a very broad set of tasks. Um, and, you know, the models are available in our API. Uh, so if you're interested, you can uh, play with them. Uh, with that, uh, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Arvind. Um, I'm going to